Welcome back to the second half of our afternoon track. Rapid regulatory changes in China later this year keeps many global investors wondering, what's next and what should I do? Well, we have a great expert to help answer those questions and more. Fred Hu, Hu Zu Liao, the economist and founder of Primavera Capital Group, and my colleague Li Xing, manager editor of Chaixin Global. Welcome, Li Xing. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you. And uh, it's a real honor to um, meet Fred online. I will give a quick introduction of Fred, and then we'll move on to the fireside chat. So Fred is actually needs very little introduction. He's a veteran investor and a senior economist. He's the founder, chairman, CEO, and chief economist of Primavera. And uh, previously, he's the partner and chairman of Goldman Sachs Greater China. But for Primavera, I mean, if we go into its portfolio companies, it's almost like a unicorn club. I will name a few. Alibaba, Ant Group, Yum China, ByteDance, Expand, Quaestro, Sin since time, you name it. So now you know is that Fred's insight on Chinese uh, market to global investors are really come from the frontline experiences. So uh, Fred, let me start with um, a big question. Some call the year 2021 as the year of regulation in China, and many investors are asking whether there will be um, change of the rapid regulatory changes, or what's next, will that be the new normal? I'm sure you You've been asked this question many times. What is your answer? So thank you, Xin. First of all, I'm uh, glad to be here, have this chat with you at the Caixin uh, uh, Summit. Um, you know, what has happened uh, on the regulatory front, you know, has been nothing short of uh, uh, a shock, right? a, a, a typhoon, if you will. Um, as a result, global markets have been uh, uh, spooked you know, with a period of shock, confusion, and, and the panic. Uh, by now, however, uh, investors have more or less digested the implications of new regulations. Even more important, uh, Chinese tech companies and entrepreneurs have made progress uh, to varying degrees in overhauling and changing the underlying business models and the practices uh, to bring their operations uh, more in line with regulations. So from this point on, I believe uh, we should see uh, more policy clarity, more uh, market tranquility, and uh, cautiously renewed uh, investor confidence uh, ahead. Thank you. That's very good news. So um, the adjustment come from the companies and the market and investors might come back. But will they come back differently or come back the same? So for instance, your exposure, you invested in so many platforms. Will that divert your um, investment more to high tech, carbon related? Or how would you uh, respond to the change in the new normal? Well, you know, you, Shin, you have given some uh, examples of our uh, investment footprint. Simply put, you know, we are focused on investing in China's new economy. That is consumer sectors, healthcare, and technology. Uh, we remain, you know, despite everything that has happened over the last couple of months, we remain uh, bullish unabashedly about the in, uh, incredible dynamism, resilience, and the potential of the Chinese uh, tech sector. So tech is the, uh, is the way going forward. And um, we talk about, the, you, you describe that as a typhoon. But behind the typhoon, what should we see? What do you think is the vision that powered this change? because the vision probably won't change in the short term. So something that the inter international investors should take notes and uh, try to align their investments to the more long-term vision. So what are these? 
Well, you know, following the big typhoon, no one has foreseen uh, you know, the markets and the media, uh, if I may say so, <laughs> have been uh, extremely focused on, uh, you know, the pains, the uncertainties and the risks uh, in the short term. Uh, however, I feel strongly that uh, one should uh, not uh, lose sight of the uh, big picture, the important structural forces underway that has been and will continue to shape the long-term trajectory of the Chinese economy and the society. So in my view, uh, the make trends we have seen in China uh, for some time, namely uh, urbanization, uh, the rise of middle class and the technological innovation, you know, remain intact. Like it or not, if we're going to, see, you know, we're going to see more and perhaps more uh, regulation over big tech. You know, by the way, not just in China, but uh, you know, globally, including the United States. Um, but the super important the trends of China's middle class consumption and innovation will be here to stay. So that's the big picture I I'm talking about. Innovation, urbanization, and more regulation on the big tech. But um, how would you see? How would you interpret the uh, common prosperity vision, and how would that impact um, how uh, the investors understand about this market? Especially, um, a lot of people worry that common prosperity probably will be more focusing on the common part rather than prosperity part. Well, that means advancement of the state at the cost of the private sectors. Do you worry? At that, about that at all? No, I'm not uh, worried about uh, uh, common possibility. I would uh, think it's a mistake to focus on one word or the other. You know, should, we should look at it uh, uh, in its uh, whole, in its uh, entirety. Um, you know, actually, you know, as an economist uh, and investor, uh, if I look at around the experience, uh, uh, you know, around the world, you know, I actually f think this is a very attractive uh, vision uh, for our country, for our society, that we all should embrace. Uh, you know, let's face the fact: inequality has caused social polarizations everywhere. You know, Brexit, the rise of Trumpism, and so on and so forth. China has had stunning success in eliminating mass poverty and the nurturing the middle class. But China also has a very big inequality challenge, like anywhere in the world. So to me, you know, common prosperity means shared prosperity or inclusive growth. That's the language economists everywhere understand. Uh, there's nothing sinister uh, about uh, this notion. Uh, I really think it's a necessary, even long overdue policy response uh, to rising inequality in China and globally. Yes. I'm confident that the Chinese leaders understand that to achieve the goal of com common prosperity, private sector is essential. Technology is essential because world economic history and the China's own developmental experience all demonstrate that entrepreneurship and the technology are the greatest engine of prosperity, period. Thank you. So entrepreneurship, technology, and also the power of the market. So this won't be um, uh, sacrificed for the common prosperity. That's a very uh, um, promising analysis. Um, I want to shift the uh, conversation a little bit into, uh, to the foreign capital. We all know in, at the early stage of China's opening up, the foreign investors actually enjoyed somewhat super national treatment, which certainly changed in about 10 years or so. Um, people do ask the question, does China, currently the world's number two economy, um, in terms of the buying, or some, somebody says the largest, in terms of the buying power, still need foreign capital? Well, first, I take a side issue with the, the factual statement. 
I don't think uh, China has, at any point in history, has given uh, foreign investors like super national treatment. That's simply uh, untrue. Uh, yes, you know, Chinese government, you know, central and uh, provincial governments, local governments have uh, maybe provided some uh, policy incentives, you know, tax or uh, so on and so forth. But that's against the backdrop of Chinese economy, you know, for a long time remained very closed. There's a, there was an unlevel playing field. There's a huge entry barrier. So in order to entice uh, international investors, China would have to give something, okay? But that's, that's not the, the same thing as so-called the supranational treatment. Um, uh, well, China today as the second largest economy and one of the uh, highest savings rate on the planet uh, still need foreign investment? The answer is yes. You know, it's not in the sense that the China is deficient uh, of capital or, or shortage of capital, uh, but it's like a trade. You know, it's not just about the exports, it's also about the imports. So investment is about, the, uh, you know, China now has served as capital. You know, we can be uh, a growing global investor, right? An export of capital. But China also needs to import the capital uh, because foreign investment, one dollar is not the same as another dollar. Uh, it's embodied the technology, uh, business model, managerial practices, new ideas. Uh, so it brings tremendous positive spiral over uh, effect on the Chinese economy. In fact, if you look at the last 40 years, the so-called China miracle, a big part of the ingredient of success comes from foreign investment that uniquely among the large economies, you know, more than Brazil, more than India, more than Russia, uh, you know, China, you know, has been able to attract massive foreign investment. Now, as we move up the ladder, as we transition from high middle income country to uh, high income country, okay, developed e economy, uh, we continue uh, need foreign investment. And uh, so I'm very encouraged uh, Chinese government has been opened up over the last few years to really open up a range of sectors, including several sectors, to greater foreign participation. That, I think, it will be very good for Chinese economy, not just in terms of job creation, uh, but, uh, you know, really um, to raise, help raise productivity and uh, to sustain uh, China's economic growth uh, for many years to come. Thank you, Fred. So um, the dollar is not just for the dollar's sake, it's for the spillover that really helped China can uh, power China's, it powered China's uh, miraculous growth and it will further power China's growth in the future. Um, uh, and slightly um, uh, shift of the question, we talk about the uh, regulation changes as one of the risks people identify with investing in China, um, but what will be other risks you think the global investor should bear in mind um, and also how they should hedge their bets? Well, you know, the, the fact of life is everywhere. You know, if I invest, you know, in every jurisdiction, every country, you know, rec uh, understanding and managing the regulatory risk, you know, is always uh, a key part of the uh, decision-making process. Okay, so China obviously is no exception because China is still evolving you know, as a modern market economy, uh, many of the uh, laws, regulations, policies are being, uh, you know, put in place. So, you know, do the homework, really gain local knowledge, but also have high standards in terms of compliance, in terms of uh, uh, speed uh, of reactions and, uh, and adjustments. Uh, all right, and one thing people ask a lot about as well, especially for uh, um, uh, international investors or international companies, is the how to offset the geopolitical risk. Uh, in the previous panel, we have the head of Trafigura in this region and says the all about U.S.-China trade and the the, the U.S.-China uh, friction forced them to do a lot of off, uh, onshoring of the business. So, how do you think investors should hedge against? U.S.-China relations, or how should they adapt themselves to uh, to that? 
Well, as I think uh, our host Singapore leaders will point out, when the two uh, elephants fight, you know, all the uh, small animals in the forest get hurt. Uh, you know, China US relationship uh, is the single most important uh, bilateral relationship. Uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the deterioration of the last few years really uh, has become a grave cause for concern uh, for investors everywhere. So we had to be cognizant of this uh, fact. Uh, but also, I believe that you know, investors can do our part to bridge uh, the two countries. Uh, you know, the more intervene, the more uh, integrated our um, you know economies through trade, through capital flows, and uh, you know we have more convergent interests. Uh, so that would uh, help uh, create the right uh, uh, climate conducive to. Um, you know, resolving some of the differences. Um, so, you know, I, uh, yes, I'm as concerned, actually, given my background, I'm particularly concerned uh, about the, 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 the current tension uh, between our two countries. Uh, but also, you know, uh, you, you, with a unique uh, vantage point of view, I do see, despite all the differences, China, US, you know, have uh, shared so many shared interests. Um, you know, whether it's um, you know global economic growth, uh, stability, uh, poverty, terrorism, climate change, pandemic, you name it. You know, no global challenger can be dealt with without the U.S. China working together. Um, so, so hopefully, uh, political leaders in both countries, uh, you know, will, uh, you know use their wisdom and the foresight to manage the current tensions, so to create a more stable, predictable uh, environment uh, for investors, not just for Chinese investors or for US investors, but for uh, global investors. For all the animals in the forest. Um, so, uh, Fred, before you go, our time is almost up, but I want to ask you a million dollar question, or in your case, given your uh, unicorn track record, it might be a billion dollar question. Um, could you help the investors to name, if you name one pitfall that investors should avoid in China in 2022 and one opportunities they really cannot miss? So one major pitfall to avoid and one investment well, opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, Shen. You know, as, as I could, uh, the, the, the one pitfall, obviously, uh, in my view, is the overreaction to recent regulatory change. Uh, and uh, just simply uh, throw in the towel and uh, decide China is not no longer investable, right? That's the single biggest pitfall. And the opportunity, I would say in our uh, era, the single biggest opportunity is climate change, uh, is climate tech. You know, China uh, as the largest uh, energy consumer, the largest carbon emitter, but it's also the largest innovator uh, of new technologies to address climate change. Everything from renewable energy to uh, electric vehicles to next gen batteries. So we see tremendously exciting uh, innovations going on in China. So that I think is the biggest opportunity for investors uh, around the world. Thank you so much, Fred. In such a short period of time, you help us cover so many grants, and uh, we'll take your advice uh, very uh, closely. Thank you so much and for joining Taishin Summit again. We look forward to uh, seeing you again next year. Thank you. So back to Yami. Thanks to Fred and Li Xing. It's a very fascinating talk.